The North, the Westerlands, the Vale, the Riverlands, the Stormlands, the Reach, the Iron Islands, Dawn and the Crownlands. That makes nine. So why is it called the Seven Kingdoms? Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we cover the best in fantasy, like A Song of Ice and Fire, The Witcher and The Lord of the Rings. If you want to know more, there's a subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. This video is a collaboration with the excellent History of Westeros. Please check out their podcast and YouTube channel for the very best in Westerosi history and lore. The Seven Kingdoms is a catchy name, but how did they arrive at the number seven, when there are clearly more than seven regions? Well, let's take a quick dive into Westerosi history to see what was going on. If we take a long view of the history of Westeros, it's clear that the number of kingdoms on the continent has fluctuated greatly over time, but generally speaking, the further back we look, the more kingdoms there are. The Starks weren't always the only kings in the north, for example. We're told that even after other notable kingdoms like the Barrow Kings had been defeated, many other petty kings remained, ruling over realms great and small and it would require thousands of years and many more wars before the last of them was conquered. And that's just in the north. Similar stories can be told elsewhere and until relatively recently in Westerosi history. It's not as well known as the Dawn Age or the Age of Heroes, but the Age of the Hundred Kingdoms is what the learned folk of Westeros call a long era that ended perhaps three to five hundred years before the conquest. One such well-educated man, Lord Elbin Massey of Stonedance, master of laws for old King Jaehaerys I, had this to say. Before there were seven kingdoms, there were eight. Before that, nine, then ten or twelve or thirty, and back and back. We speak of the hundred kingdoms of the heroes when there were actually ninety-seven at one time, or one hundred and thirty-two at another, and so on, the number forever changing. We don't know what the twelve, thirty, ten, or even nine were, but we do know that the eight kingdoms that he refers to was the state of affairs prior to the Stormlands' conquest of the Riverlands. They held it for three hundred years or so, before losing it to the Iron Islands, who held it for the next hundred years as the Kingdom of the Isles and the Rivers. So the simple answer as to why the Seven Kingdoms is that there just happened to have been seven kings in Westeros at the time when Aegon and his sisters conquered. Well, technically six kings and one Princess of Dawn. But of course a ruling prince or Princess of Dawn is the same rank as a king, the difference is merely a stylistic cultural difference. Furthermore, seven had been the number of kingdoms in Westeros for about 400 years when the conquest began, so it had been the state of affairs for well beyond living memory. The Old Nan equivalents of that time would tell stories of smaller kingdoms passed down from long ago, but noble children would have been taught that there were seven kingdoms in Westeros, and had been for quite some time. It was shorthand for all of Westeros. When Aegon and his sisters and dragons completed the conquest, they could have chosen to rename it One Kingdom, doing away with the old regions entirely. After all, those former kings were demoted to high lords and ladies thenceforth. There were no more seven kings for seven kingdoms, just one king and one realm. The Targaryens could have called it the Targaryen Empire, say, or New Valyria, but Aegon wanted to ease the realm into this new arrangement to make some changes more gradually than others. For example, at first the old individual kingdoms kept their own laws, though that did change eventually. It was only with Jaehaerys I a century or so later that a real codified and unified set of laws started to emerge. Which is all well and good, but the North, the Westlands, the Vale, the Riverlands, the Stormlands, the Reach, the Iron Islands, Dawn and the Crownlands that's still nine. There is a technical answer to this, and also a more point of principle one from the Targaryen's perspective. The technical answer is that first of all, one of those nine, the Crownlands, is more of an administrative region than it is a kingdom. Aegon himself created it, basically by just drawing a line on a map, of some islands he already owned or his close allies owned, and some disputed territories between kingdoms. Dragonstone, Driftmark, Claw Isle, Cracklaw Point, Duskendale, Rossby and Massey's Hook. The area around the new capital of King's Landing, basically. The Crownlands is a royal fief, 
In other words, the lands claimed by the king for his personal seat, enough to support the needs of the royal house in terms of service, soldiers, taxes and such. There's no Lord Paramount here as a middleman, just the king. One could think of the crown lands as structurally similar to what's done in the United States of America, say. The USA comprises 50 states, but the nation's capital, Washington DC, is technically not part of any of those 50, nor is it considered a state of its own. DC stands for District of Columbia. The Crown Lands is the loose Westerosi equivalent to a district, we could say. So, not a kingdom, and not therefore one of the Seven Kingdoms. Then the other technical thing that Aegon did was to split one of the kingdoms he had conquered in half. This was the Kingdom of the Isles and the Rivers that we mentioned earlier, which was basically the Iron Islands and their conquered lands in the Riverlands of Westeros. That was the one that Harren the Black, he of Harrenhal fame, ruled. Aegon split that in two and made two Lords Paramount. The Iron Islands under House Greyjoy and the Seastone Chair, who could boast of many kings in their storied history, and the Riverlands ruled by House Tully, who made no such boasts and had no special chair, for they had never been kings. So six kingdoms conquered, one royal fiefdom created, one former kingdom split in half, that puts us back to seven-ish. The Riverlands, the Iron Islands, the North, the Vale, the West, the Stormlands and the Reach. As I said, that's the technicality. The Targaryens could indeed claim to rule seven kingdoms, technically. But of course, the big issue here is Dawn. Aegon never conquered Dawn, and other than a brief occupation under Diron the I, it didn't join the Seven Kingdoms until the year 187 AC. Dawn was one of the original Seven Kingdoms that Aegon set out to conquer, but wasn't a part of the Seven Kingdoms realm that followed. Which is how we come to the point of principle here for the Targaryens, which is much more important for them. The Targaryens may not have conquered Dawn, but they still claimed it was theirs. They claimed to rule all of Westeros, it's just that the Dornish hadn't yet submitted to this. They openly claimed to be kings of the Rhoynar, the Dornish people, in their royal title. This is how Aegon I's coronation is described in Fire and Blood. His High Holiness himself anointed Aegon with the seven oils, placed a crown upon his head, and proclaimed him Aegon of House Targaryen, the first of his name, King of the Andals, the Rhoynar, and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, and Protector of the Realm. Seven Kingdoms was the style he used, though Dawn had not submitted, nor would it, for more than a century to come. The recent revelations in House of the Dragon, and hints by George R. R. Martin, adds an extra layer to this. The Targaryens were prophecy-bound, with the Song of Ice and Fire passed down from monarch to monarch, to rule the entire continent, because they had to save the entire continent from the threat from the north. In that light, naming themselves rulers of the Six Kingdoms would have been an admission of failure. They would rule all seven kingdoms, they had to. It was their destiny. And there is another reason, I suppose, for sticking to using Seven Kingdoms, whatever the real number was. The number seven is sacred to the overwhelming majority of Westerosi, since most worship the Seven. Aegon took great care to adopt the religion of the kingdom he sought to rule, abandoning overtly worshipping the Valyrian gods his house had honoured since times unknown, and getting himself crowned by the High Septon. Though House Targaryen kept certain rights and privileges not granted to others who lacked the blood of the dragon, for the most part they followed the tenets of the Faith of the Seven. Though he won by force and forged his throne by dragonfire, Aegon knelt to be crowned Lord of the Seven Kingdoms by the High Septon in Old Town, showing the realm that he would rule by the mandate of the Seven above. Seven was a holy number. There are seven members of the Kingsguard. Someone's guilt or innocence can be decided by a trial of seven, and so on. And so... When Dawn peacefully joined the Seven Kingdoms by marriage 180-some years after the conquest, the name remained unchanged. It didn't become the Eight Kingdoms, nor the Seven Kingdoms and One Principality. Not only would it be cumbersome to alter the name, it would be difficult, as it had been habit for centuries and folk would simply not like it. In modern parlance, by then, the Seven Kingdoms had quite a bit of brand recognition. 
Not to mention the Targaryens of this era were at peak piety. The first Targaryen Martell marriage was arranged by none other than Baylor the Blessed. The groom in that wedding was Prince Deiron, later King Deiron II, the Good, who married his sister Daenerys to Prince Maron Martell to complete the union of the realms. King Deiron himself was quite pious, and would never have consented to change the name of the kingdom, given it was named after the gods he held so dear. So that's why the Seven Kingdoms is called the Seven Kingdoms, not the Six or Eight or anything else. But it's worth noting that this is just the name the Seven Kingdoms calls itself. Beyond the realm, they have their own names for Westeros, and they rarely bother with any sort of number, let alone Seven Kingdoms. Some in Essos call it the Sunset Kingdoms, or, as the Dothraki name it, the Land of the Andals. Beyond the Wall, they don't call it the Seven Kingdoms, they just call the people Kneelers and mock the idea, though they are willing to make exceptions for the strong. There have been quite a few kings beyond the Wall, and while we're at it, the Night's Watch dealt with the Night's King. All of those events took place on the continent of Westeros too, and on top of that, we don't even know where in the north the continent actually ends. Keeping the name the Seven Kingdoms may have been partly because Aegon was so set on uniting Westeros under Targaryen rule, but he didn't unite it, not the whole continent. Even if it's inevitable that the Seven Kingdoms evolves into something else, such change could take quite some time. Humans are creatures of habit and comfort, and the people of Westeros like their seven gods and their seven kingdoms, even if it takes some wrangling to make maths work. Still, if one dragon king and his sister wives can change Westeros for centuries, perhaps a dragon queen can change it again. Or if not her, perhaps other factors and forces of human nature will. What was once a hundred kingdoms became six, and that could eventually become one kingdom, or perhaps the Six Kingdoms, as on the TV show, or something else entirely, a realm not ruled from a throne at all. But history does not always march forward in a straight line. There are often steps back, other paths taken. We have the Seven Kingdoms now, during A Song of Ice and Fire, but when it ends, there may be more than Seven Kingdoms, or fewer. War and winter will weigh in, and we will see. If you'd like to see more videos about the world of A Song of Ice and Fire, please click on the link on the left of your screen now. Or to support this channel, the best way to do that is through the link to Patreon appearing on the right of your screen now. That's all for this time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.